Welcome. I'm your host, Brad Bates, and this is Dark Classics, a show that reaches into the past to pull out familiar and not-so-familiar short stories and poems from the Gothic and Victorian eras. Classics from authors like Edgar Allan Poe, Bram Stoker, Percy Shelley, Charles Dickens, and more. So sit back, turn the lights down low, get comfortable, and let's open a new chapter to a dark classic. The Crystal Cup by Bram Stoker. Chapter 1 The Dream Birth. The blue waters touch the walls of the palace. I can hear their soft, lapping wash against the marble whenever I listen. Far out at sea, I can see the waves glancing in the sunlight, ever smiling, ever glancing, ever sunny. Happy waves, happy in your gladness, thrice happy that ye are free. I rise from my work and spring up the wall till I reach the embrasure. I grasp the corner of the stonework and draw myself up till I crouch in the wide window. See, see, out away as far as my vision extends, there I gaze till my eyes grow dim, and in the dimness of my eyes my spirit finds its sight. My soul flies on the wings of memory, away beyond the blue, smiling sea, away beyond the glancing waves and the gleaming sails to the land I call my home. As the minutes roll by, my actual eyesight seems to be restored, and I look round me in my old birth house. The rude simplicity of the dwelling comes back to me as something new. There I see my old books and manuscripts and pictures, and there, away on their old shelves, high up above the door, I see my first rude efforts in art. How poor they seem to me now, and yet, were I free, I would not give the smallest of them for all I now possess. Possess how I dream. The dream calls me back to waking life. I spring down from my window seat and work away frantically, for every line I draw on paper, every new form that springs on the plaster brings me nearer freedom. I will make a vase whose beauty will put to shame the glorious works of Greece in her golden prime. Surely, a love like mine and a hope like mine must in time make some form of beauty spring to life. When he beholds it, he will exclaim with rapture and will order my instant freedom. I can forget my hate and the deep debt of revenge which I owe him when I think of liberty even from his hands. Ah, then on the wings of the morning shall I fly beyond the sea to my home, her home and clasp her to my arms, never more to be separated. But, O oh spirit of day, if she should be... No, no, I cannot think of it, or I shall go mad. O oh time, time, maker and destroyer of men's fortunes, why hasten so fast for others whilst thou laggest so slowly for me? Even now my home may have become desolate, and she, my bride of an hour, may sleep calmly in the cold earth." Oh, this suspense will drive me mad. Work, work. Freedom is before me. Aurora is the reward of my labor. So I rush to my work, but to my brain and hand, heated alike, no fire or strength descends. Half mad with despair, I beat myself against the walls of my prison and then climb into the embrasure and once more gaze upon the ocean, but find there no hope. And so I stay till night. Casting its pall of blackness over nature puts the possibility of effort away from me for yet another day. So my day goes on and grow to weeks and months. So will they grow to years, should life so long remain an unwelcome guest within me. For what is man without hope, and is not hope nigh dead within this weary breast? Last night in my dreams there came, like an inspiration from the day spirit, a design for my face. All day my yearning for freedom, for Aurora, or news of her, had increased tenfold, and my heart and brain were on fire. 
Madly, I beat myself like a caged bird against my prison bars. Madly, I leaped to my window seat and gazed with bursting eyeballs out on the free, open sea. And there I sat till my passion had worn itself out, and then I slept and dreamed of thee, Aurora, of thee and freedom. In my ears I heard again the old song we used to sing together when, as children, we wandered on the beach, when, as lovers, we saw the sun sink in the ocean, and I would see its glory doubled as it shone in thine eyes and was mellowed against thy cheek, and when, as my bride, you clung to me as my arms went round you on that desert tongue of land, whence rushed that band of sea robbers that tore me away. Oh, how my heart curses those men, not men, but fiends. But one solitary gleam of joy remains from that dread encounter, that my struggle stayed those hellhounds, and that ere I was stricken down, this right hand sent one of them to his home. My spirit rises as I think of that blow that saved thee from a life worse than death. With the thought, I feel my cheeks burning and my forehead swelling with mighty veins. My eyes burn, and I rush wildly round my prison house. Oh, for one of my enemies that I might dash out his brains against these marble walls and trample his heart out as he lay before me. These walls would spare him not. They are pitiless, alas, I know too well. Oh, cruel mockery of kindness to make a palace a prison and to taunt a captive's aching heart with forms of beauty and sculptured marble. Wondrous indeed are these sculptured walls. Men call them passing fair, but oh, Aurora, with thy beauty ever before my eyes, what form that men call lovely can be fair to me? Like him who gazes sunwards and then sees no light on earth. From the glory that dyes his iris, so thy beauty or its memory has turned the fairest things of earth to blackness and deformity. In my dream last night, when in my ears came softly, like music stealing across the waters from afar, the old song we used to sing together, then, to my brain, like a ray of light, came an idea whose grandeur for a moment struck me dumb. Before my eyes grew a vase of such beauty that I knew my hope was born to life and that the great spirit had placed my foot on the ladder that leads from this palace dungeon to freedom and to thee. Today I have got a block of crystal, for only in such pellucid substance can I body forth my dream and have commenced my work. I found at first that my hand had lost its cunning, and I was beginning to despair when, like the memory of a dream, there came back in my ears the strains of the old song. I sang it softly to myself, and as I did so, I grew calmer. But, oh, how differently the song sounded to me when thy voice, Aurora, rose not in unison with my own. But what avails pining to work, to work? Every touch of my chisel will bring me nearer thee. My vase is daily growing nearer to completion. I sing as I work, and my constant song is the one I love so well. I can hear the echo of my voice in the vase, and as I end, the wailing song note is prolonged in sweet, sad music in the crystal cup. I listen, ear down, and sometimes I weep as I listen. So sadly comes the echo to my song. Imperfect though it be, my voice makes sweet music, and its echo in the cup guides my hand towards perfection as I work. Would that thy voice rose and fell with mine, Aurora, and then the world would behold a vase of such beauty as never before woke up the slumbering fires of man's love for what is fair. For if I do such work in sadness, imperfect as I am in my solitude and sorrow, what would I do in joy, perfect when with thee? I know that my work is good as an artist, and I feel that it is as a man. And the cup itself, as it daily grows in beauty, gives back a clearer echo. Oh, if I worked in joy, how gladly would it give back our voices. Then would we hear an echo in music such as mortals seldom hear. But now the echo, like my song, seems imperfect. I grow daily weaker. But still, I work on. Work with my whole soul, for am I not working for freedom and for thee? My work is nearly done. Day by day, hour by hour, the vase grows more finished. Ever clearer comes the echo whilst I sing, ever softer. 
Ever more sad and heartrending comes the echo of the wail at the end of the song. Day by day, I grow weaker and weaker. Still, I work on with all my soul. At night, the thought comes to me whilst I think of thee that I will never see thee more. That I breathe out my life into the crystal cup and that it will last there when I am gone. So beautiful has it become, so much do I love it that I could gladly die to be maker of such a work. Were it not for thee, my love for thee, and my hope of thee, and my fear for thee, and my anguish for thy grief when thou knowest I am gone. My work requires but few more touches. My life is slowly ebbing away, and I feel that with my last touch, my life will pass out forever into the cup. Till that touch is given, I must not die. I will not die. My hate has passed away. So great are my wrongs that revenge of mine would be too small a compensation for my woe. I leave revenge to a juster and a mightier than I. Thee, O Aurora, I will await in the land of flowers where thou and I will wander. Never more to part, never more. Ah, never more. Farewell, Aurora. To Dark Classics. This has been a Red Oak Media production. All musical scores are written and recorded by Jonathan Hamlet and narration recorded by Brad Bates. Tune in next time for a new chapter of another Dark Classic. Dark classic.